So thanks. Um, <clears throat> I got to say that this title no longer exactly applies to what I'm going to talk with you about. In particular, originally and in the abstract for the colloquium, what I what I uh, suggested I would do bore a remarkable resemblance to what I talked about at, to, at the Nevada Water Resource Association last year, and I decided to to do something different just in case there was too much overlap. Obviously, I'm going to talk today about atmospheric rivers. Um, storms, not so much about drought, frankly, although we'll touch on that. And the real missing element here, I've got to admit, is the Nevada, the and Nevada part of this. Um, but what I'm talking about uh, is actually um, relevant in Nevada. I'm just not going to, uh, at the Nevada Re Water Resources Association meeting, I sort of stepped through all the climate divisions in Nevada and talked about the role of atmospheric rivers. Just a, frankly, a first cut. I haven't really had enough time to really spend to actually dive deep on those, but a first cut look at how they, the, those things work. Um, just to motivate talking about atmospheric rivers in this part of the world, uh, here we've got the annual peak flows uh, at ranked basically. Um, for the Truckee River here in, in Reno. And uh, the different colors represent different storm mechanisms or mechanisms for th that drive these annual peak floods. Um, and the smallest ones are sorted this way and the largest ones over there. And the main point here is that, yeah, we've got various mechanisms that drive our floods on the Truckee. Um, and atmospheric rivers are one of those things. But when you get up towards this end of the, of the curve, towards the large floods, um, atmospheric rivers start to take over and become the mechanism for generating these large floods. In particular, above 5,000 CFS, you can see that the, the uh, pie chart has gone three quarters uh, atmospheric rivers. If you actually look up above the uh, declared flood stage, which is 11 feet at the gauge there, they're all atmospheric rivers. So this is a major mechanism even here on this side of the Sierra for uh, how we make big storms and floods. Ah, keep trying to do it. Anyway, so what am I actually going to talk about? I want to just tell you a couple of stories basically. One of them is uh, sort of a little bit of a history on, on what are these things called atmospheric rivers and why we are talking about them as though they're, they're something new. Um, and then the other is a story about how we, how we in California have been using uh, our growing knowledge of these things to, uh, well, in the state of California. Um, I hope you don't find this one too obnoxious. It's about California. It's also obnoxious in a California sense in that it's big. It's written big. Um, lots of money flowing around and that sort of thing. But for me, it's just a matter of, okay, what do you do when you start to learn about a phenomenon that for certain purposes are new phenomena that, are, that turn out to be very important to how floods, droughts, uh, water resources in the state, and frankly ecosystems in the state um, uh, operate. What do you do with that information? So, um, two stories. Those are the two stories. I've got to keep reaching over here forgetting I got this in my hand. So let's talk about, you know, what are these things? Why do we treat them as though they're new? Um, here's an image of the uh, GOES uh, infrared water, va water vapor channel uh, um, globally. It's, well, it's multiple satellites, but the global uh, imagery. And this is how we tended to see and think about, and long before there were satellites, we were thinking about uh, the w atmospheric arm, the uh, uh, water cycle, sort of from, from this perspective. And the point is the uh, light colors here are where there is, in, in, in quotes, lots of water vapor. The black areas are where there's uh, essentially none or very low amounts. This is a particular date, which used to be, uh, it's up there, but the 14th of, of March in, uh, a couple of years ago, well, 2012. And... Um, <clears throat> Main thing here is that when you look at it this way, there's a, it looks as though basically the atmospheric arm of the water cycle is a story of, of big bubbles of moist air sort of jostling with each other and little thin 
bands of dry air here and there. Um, and if you look at a lot of the, uh, a lot of the older uh, uh, general circulation of the, of the atmosphere sorts of textbooks, the, the story tends to be drawn in terms of these very long-term average, average conditions that make the world look like this. Now, the reason why this looks like this, well, let me, let me come back to that in a second. In 1998, um, we got to a place where this uh, uh, special sensor microwave imager system, uh, we, had, we had them up in orbit, and we got to a place where we were getting global coverage twice a day from these critters. Um, and uh, and there, so this is microwave view of water vapor, and that one's a, an infrared version. And when we look at this, we start to see in the tropics, it's big, big broad areas of, of, uh, of warm colors, which are lots of water vapor. Outside the tropics, it, we see you know, much less water vapor, big surprise. But what we see are these, these uh, tendrils of high water vapor, sort of, uh, this is a summer time, northern summer uh, image, um, and, and uh, I, I believe, and uh, it actually corresponds to that day. But um, we see these, these tendrils that will ultimately, no, no surprise, be what these things called atmospheric rivers. And the question, immediate question is, what's the difference? Why, why are we seeing two different things here? And the difference is that with the, the, uh, the infrared, uh, you look down from the satellite, and basically you look down through a certain amount of water vapor and see the temperature there, infrared. It's a, it's a temperature measure. You see the temperature you know, at that point where you've looked through effectively a certain amount of water vapor. That's, that amount of water vapor is only a few millimeters. So if I take, you know, I look down through the atmosphere until I get to a place where everything above me, if you condensed it down and brought it down to sea level, would amount to a couple, a couple of millimeters of water. Um, and so what this is looking at is water vapor at the highest altitudes up, up near the tropopause in the atmosphere. Cold up there, it's not much water vapor that we're actually looking at. But everything below that is ma effectively masked. The, uh, the sensor has more or less saturated at that point, and you don't, simply don't see the rest of the atmosphere in terms of the water vapor. The microwave imager, you know, actually gives us the total amount of water vapor down to the surface. Um, it's difficult to separate out soil moisture and vegetation and that sort of thing, things that hold water on the land surface here. But over the oceans, you know that when I get to the ocean, it's 100% water. And so we only can really use this at present for the most, well, we can only use this to look at the total amount of water vapor in the atmosphere above the oceans. And so, when we, in 1990, it was only really in 1998 that we got to a place where we could see all the water vapor in the atmosphere. And when we saw it, we saw these things. We saw that outside the uh, tropics, it wasn't big bubbles of moist air jostling with each other. In fact, that's up at, up at it's not that moist, but that's up at higher altitudes. But for the total amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, it's these, it, the water vapor moves around in these very narrow bands. So um, here's an animation of, of what this looks like if you start stacking m many of these together. And so what we're seeing here, clearly, this one definitely is northern summer. And um, <clears throat> what you see here in the winter hemisphere are these long, narrow bands of uh, high water vapor content that uh, they don't stay in one place, they're moving around, they form, they start to come apart after a while. Uh, they're very transient uh, uh, features of the atmosphere and of the uh, extratropical water cycle. These are our atmospheric rivers. Um, in the same year, Zhu and Newell, more or less, I, I believe is. Well, they coined the term atmospheric rivers. Zhu and Newell were researchers at MIT. And what they were looking at wasn't SSMI uh, imagery. They were looking at, uh, at 
a, just a few years worth of, of uh, weather forecasts, weather forecasts basically, from a numeric, from a numerical model. And when they looked at it, when, when, it, when you take the average, those moving little features there tend to average out and smear out, and you get, the, you get this sense that, that you know, the, the moisture in the extratropical atmosphere is pretty broad and, and smeared out. But when you look at them, you know, instantane, you know at, at various instants in time, snapshots in time, what they found as they looked through several years' worth of these data, these, these simulations, was that um, actually, you know, these features are moving around, but as it says down here at the bottom, some, they, they calculated that some 95% of the poleward vapor uh, transport outside the tropics was happening in these narrow bands, of which typically in the, uh, well, typically you'll have somewhere, on, this is a fairly typical scene, you're talking about, uh, what is that, about eight, eight of these narrow pathways uh, around the globe, <clears throat> typically more in the winter hemisphere, um, although this one's right on the shoulder season. Um, and there, you know, if you add up all the width of these narrow pa of these pathways for uh, water vapor transport all the way around the globe, they found that 95% on average of the uh, of poleward water vapor was was in. A dozen or so of these things, not a dozen, a, a dozen or less of these, these pathways that together constitute at any given latitude band 10%, no, less than 10% of the zonal circumference. So rather than big bubbles of moist air moving around in the extra tropics as the water, water uh, cycle, the machinery was very narrow and intense. Um, different view of the world. In the same year, 1998 is a, one of those uh, Annis Marevalis sort of things as far as atmospheric rivers go. In the same year, it was a big El Nino year, comparable to the one we're in right now down in the tropics. And um, the NOAA folks, Marty Ralph, my lo longtime colleague on this stuff, the NOAA folks had a program called uh, CalJet where they were flying out to meet uh, winter storms as they approached and dropping, dropping drop songs, which are essentially you take a, a weather balloon and take off the, weather, the, the balloon and drop it out of the back of the uh, aircraft, and it falls through the atmosphere instead of rising through it, and you, you're getting the me same measurements. Um, they flew out through, through some of these storms, and they found these very intense, low-level jets that were conducting large amounts of water vapor. And when they looked... To, they, they were smart enough to look to this new fangled stuff called the SSMI imagery and uh, realize that there were only half a dozen of these narrow bands uh, that around the globe. They scaled up from, okay, we saw this much water vapor being transported through that storm there. By the way, that's the vertical is the vertical. And then uh, the lateral is, is across one of these atmospheric rivers. And for our purposes, the... Uh, Water vapor transport is the various colors, shades of pink there. Uh, but in any event, um, what they, they scaled up, basically multiplied by six, what they saw in this one and found that, gosh, that's you know, in the ballpark of what this paper in GRL the same year was saying happens all the time. And so they re recognized that, okay, right now we're looking at this, new, this thing that Zhu and Newell recently called an atmospheric river. So in that year, we basically, the satellite imagery to see these things all the time, uh, everywhere, emerged. Um, the term itself and recognition that they exist in weather uh, models um, emerged. And we got our first real intense look through the heart of, of one of these, uh, actually several of these. Um, and so, you know, that's when we can kind of say the whole, this whole business of atmospheric rivers sort of was sparked. That's, that's where it came from. Um, so where do they fit into the uh, extratropical atmospheric uh, water cycle? You've heard a lot about atmospheric rivers in the, in the newspapers and that sort of stuff. And um, where they fit, and this is a very simple 
vision of it. But where they fit is we've got these mid-latitude mid cyclones, which are the low-pressure centers that we have traditionally viewed as being constituting our storms outside the tropics, or especially our winter storms outside the tropics. Um, and nature of the, uh, of the geophysical fluid dynamics is that uh, um, fronts form and, for all intents and purposes, sort of radiate out from these, uh, these low pressure systems where the, the, uh, there's cyclones, so the circulation's going this way. Um, and as you get close to them in the warm, in the, uh, in the warm sector, you get into a situation where the, uh, as the uh, air sort of is spiraling in towards the low pressure at the core of this thing, the dynamics of the atmosphere, the geophysical fluid dynamics, the, the rotation of the earth and the like all conspire to uh, allow it to sort of bring, rise up as it enters into the cyclone, it rises up, cools, you get a lot of precipitation. Or areas, far north of us, relatively far north of us, and in the Atlantic Basin in particular, where a lot of tr traditional meteorology was spawned, um, that's the way that you get the uplift, and that's the way that you get your storms. But what we were seeing in the, uh, in the SSMI imagery was that actually it wasn't, the real action in many cases wasn't here in the heart of the storm, it was in the approach to the storm. And these atmospheric rivers, are typically feeders that are bringing water vapor in large amounts. I don't know if I say it how much there, but large amounts up into the, you know, left to their own devices, it goes up into the, the mid latitude cyclone. This WCB is warm conveyor belt. That's an old traditional term for, for this area where the vapor is being lifted up as you kind of spiral into the storm. Um, the atmospheric river will typically, but not always, feed, be the feeder that actually supplies the moisture to the warm conveyor belt. And very often, but again, in no sense, not even, not even most of the time, probably you know, a, a, uh, uh, at best half the time, these things will be tapping directly into the trop tropics. And so there's this thing called tropical moisture exports. Right now in the literature, in the hydrometeorology literature, um, we've got folks who are focused Traditional part of these storms, uh, you know, often focusing the, in this warm conveyor belt. We've got people like me and others who are sort of focusing down here in the approach to the warm conveyor belt, and I'll tell you why we do that in a moment. And then there are folks who are really focused very much on, you know, the, uh, these, these occasional bursts of moisture out of, the, out of the tropics. And we're all trying to come at get at a sense where we can start to uh, say things like, um, say things about the seasonal the interannual variability of storms in various parts of the world, uh, the intensity of storms when they do arise, a whole bunch of these things. But frankly, there's, there's sort of several camps out there in the literature right now. Why are we focused here in this part of the world, California, Nevada, uh, up the west coast on these atmospheric rivers? It's kind of shown here. What happens for us, for the most part, is that with most, well, most of our most extreme storms, it's not that they, well, when you're out over the ocean, the atmospheric river just sort of plays a part in, in fueling uh, the storm here at the heart of the, the, uh, of the uh, cyclone. But what happens here to make our biggest storms is that uh, before, this feed of water can reach the mid-latitude cyclone, it, reach, it, it encounters the west coast and the mountains there, okay? And so what we're in a situation is that all, a lot of our attention has been focused up here, but actually it's, it's down here that we get our largest storms, and I'll show you, I'll prove that to you in a minute. Um, but it, so again, just want to make this point that this is a rather different vision of how the global water cycle works, especially outside the tropics, where it's really in these narrow bands, um, very intense transports of water vapor in narrow bands, and as opposed to this big broad uh, picture of uh, 
of moist bubbles bouncing around the atmosphere. So what happens when they hit the, the west coast, hit the mountains? Well, the obvious thing happens is these things are, uh, I haven't really described them too much, and I'm not sure the color scheme there is going to work great, but let's talk about what they actually sort of quantify it a little bit. Seen from above, these things, uh, we don't consider them to be atmospheric rivers unless they're at least a couple thousand kilometers long, but some get up to 10,000 kilometers long. They'll go all the way back to the Philippines from the west coast in some cases. Um, they're, they're, they're supposed to be rivers, and so they have to be much, much narrower than they are long. And so a typical number is that they are, you know, very often they're about 400 kilometers wide, okay, and, to, and a couple thousand to quite a few thousand kilometers long. <clears throat> um, and, uh, and let me see here. Yeah, okay, so we can continue. When they reach the mountains, then, you know, the, the thing that, so they're low, low, I'm not sure it says there. Yeah, okay, let me continue on. Intense jet, low-level jet of vapor transport that sits typically between about one and two kilometers above the surface. Right now, one of the hot topics in atmospheric river science, sparked by work here, um, is we're finally turning to the question of does it matter how high in the atmosphere that, to the outcome here on the continent, how, how high that water vapor transport is, is, is concentrated. But typically in the range of one to two kilometers above sea level, there's this intense jet. Um, the amounts of water that it carries, water vapor that it carries are equivalent. We see a, a full range of, of intensities for these things, but they range from 10 to 20 Mississippi's worth of water. So in other words, she took it all down, compressed it down into to, uh, liquid water, it would uh, be the equivalent uh, coming across the west coast of uh, 10 times the average, 10 to 20 times the average uh, flow of the Mississippi into the, uh, into the Gulf of Mexico. There's a lot of water, water being transported along these things. The atmosphere in which they're embedded is typically um, close to neutrally stable, which means that they're actually easy to lift up if something gets in their way, like mountains. And once they get lifted up, then, you know, the obvious things happen. With the warm conveyor belt, we saw that the dynamics of the atmosphere itself were sort of doing the uplift. The uplift, the air cools, the vapor con uh, condenses, falls out, you get, you get a storm, you get precipitation. When these things hit our mountains, same sort of thing happens. They're in a part of the atmosphere, they're in a, uh, a profile of the atmosphere, a condition of the atmosphere that's relatively easy to lift up. So they indeed lift up and over uh, to greater or lesser extent. They cool, they condense, they drop lots and lots of water. Um, yeah, let me, uh, so here's, a, here's some radar imagery. Uh, showing a particular storm from last December, uh, from December a year ago. No, is that right? Oh, no, this is, this is this one, yeah, okay. From earlier this winter. And you can see that as they come in, basically as they're shoving in, we just get these narrow bands of, of water vapor. And, and what's going on here is that the whole structure is sort of moving in like this, as was shown in that earlier uh, diagram. And as it pushes in, the, the direction on the coast of, of uh, the, uh, the, well, the mountains, the, the orientation of the mountains and the like and the coast is such that as it moves in this way, uh, for our, when we're standing still, it appears that the storm is sort of tracking down the coast, but that's really just sort of where it's intercepting the, uh, the, the topography and the like. <sighs> so how big do these storms get? I keep saying these are really the, the big ones in some sense. This figure shows for, their, uh, for essentially all, weather, all co-op weather stations in the U.S. that have more than 30 years of record since 1950, um, the very largest three-day total of precipitation ever recorded at each station, at each of the stations. There's a lot more stations than dots here because I start, only start counting them when they're, when they're in three days you get more than 200 millimeters of precipitation. Okay, and then the color scheme is such that yellow ones are greater than 400 millimeters and the red ones are greater than 500 millimeters. 
And my point with that is just that if you look for where the red, the yellow, even the green are, they're very much, there are two places where they are. One is here, you know, in the southeast and the like, and this is where we have hurricanes and tropical storms showing up and making landfall and the like. The other place where you see them, well, frankly, when you get up to red and yellow is in, in, is in California, in the Sierra Nevada, in the coastal range, ranges and the transverse range down here in Southern California. And what this is saying, now, so these are just comparing absolute amounts of the largest, the absolute sizes of the largest storms. And what we're seeing is that our storms in California uh, here are every bit as big in absolute terms as landfalling hurricanes and the like. So these are big, and, and once you get past those two areas, there's no other place that competes. So the, ours are as big as any in the country. And I can go up to 600 millimeters and 700 millimeters, and the story stays the same. Ours is as big as any place else in the country. And, um, and you know, yeah. And I will say that some 97% of the yellow and red dots um, east of, well, that dashed line right there, are atmospheric river arrivals, OK? So this is how we make our biggest storms. And our biggest storms are as big as any in the country. So these are a big deal. Um, but they're not all big. That's one thing that we've maybe overemphasized is how big they get. They're not all, they're not all big. So here's a, uh, here's a uh, essentially, you want to picture this as an uh, annual flood recurrence uh, analysis. But instead of stream flow in a river, flood flows in a river, I'm mapping the amount of water vapor coming down these atmospheric rivers. So the largest atmospheric river each year as it hits the, uh, hits the west coast at various latitudes is being ranked here in much the way I did the Truckee River towards the beginning of that. These are smoother because I've plotted it onto a log Pearson type 3 paper, essentially. Uh, we're looking at up here with solid lines how big storms get, how often we get the very biggest storms along the coast. And then the dots down here are back at 112.5 degrees west longitude. So pretty much, pretty well, far well inland, um, a little bit into Utah, basically. Um, and what we're seeing here is that these things range in the interior, in the far interior, from about 300 or so um, of these units, which is basically the amount of kilograms of water vapor that come by every square, every uh, transect of a meter per second in these things. Up to, in this case, the red, red dots here are, are down here near Tucson. And they go up to, uh, what is that, about seven, seven, uh, eight, uh, 800 units this way. Um, but frankly, the, uh, we don't, another thing that I haven't told you is that we don't call them atmospheric rivers unless in these terms of this, this water vapor transport, the number rises above 250, OK? So in, in quite a few years, we don't see these things. Well, you know, the, the largest atmospheric river is, no large, is just barely above what it would take for us to call it an atmospheric river. So these really span a broad gamut. Um, some, several things are going on here, obviously. By the time you get into the interior, the transport rates have been reduced considerably by interference and, and uplift over other mountains, condensation, that sort of thing. Uh, whereas at the coast, we see lots more making, making landfall. Um, the color scheme here is about where you, know, where you are latitude-wise. And let me just point out a couple of things. One is all this purple-blue stuff up here is pretty much the uh, latitude of the uh, Sierra. If you look at where those, where they are on that legend. Um, and so what you see is that as it happens, the very largest ARs, it turns out, and this was a little bit of a surprise, um, arrive pretty much in northern central California on the coast. It falls off to the north. That's these, these curves here, black and, the thin black and red, falls off to the south. Um, <clears throat> another thing that's got, well, I mean, yeah. And then as I, if you look at these, and if you were to decipher the colors again, 
what you would find is that um, those purple, purple blue guys that were at the latitude of the Sierra are down here at the bottom. And that's the rain shadowing of the, uh, by the Sierra well into the interior. So these things uh, to the north and south of the Sierra can make a lot of interior, uh, can get pretty far into the interior, but, but at the latitude of the Sierra, they, they get chopped off and are much reduced compared to what they are on landfall. Um, this kind of shows that, but it also shows, I've been talking about these things as though they're all nasty. They're part of our water supply. So two things going on here. This is some work by John Rutz in, in Utah where he basically added up the total amount of precipitation that falls on, on, um, on all days and then compares that to the amount that falls on days when there are atmospheric rivers passing overhead. And when you do that, these warm colors, uh, so for instance in California, it ranges from about 35% of the total precipitation comes out of these critters to 50%, okay? Um, <clears throat> you can see that by the time we get interior, say into uh, southern Idaho, sorry, we're down in the, uh, let's say, into the 25% 20, 20, 20, level contribution from these critters. Similar, similar sort of things happen to the south into, into Arizona and the like. But you can see on there that big blue tongue pointing right at the uh, Sierra Nevada, and that's the rain shadow of the Sierra Nevada in terms of these critters, okay? One important thing to note is that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't end exactly at the, the, the blue doesn't reach all the way to the Sierra so that where we're at right now, we're still in the 20, 30, 30%, 35% range. So these things do manage to push in and give us a lot of our, our uh, precipitation here, our overall precipitation. The more sort of thing is happening in southern, in southern Nevada a little bit, I, I'm not sure how the dots really work there. I'm not convinced that there's really a bullseye over, over Coyote Springs Valley or something, which happens to be right, you know, close enough to Vegas so that it's like I can't really tell you what's happening in Vegas because the data looks a little bit flaky there. But there is, you know, by the time you get down towards Vegas, you can see the penetration of these critters starts to be important again. You know, when you get here, you know, just a simple fact uh, that if we look at, uh, well, on at, well, you can see it there. On average, a atmospheric river storms at Tahoe City, on average, end up being warmer by 2 degrees and wetter by 85% than, the, uh, than wet days, in, than all wet days lumped together, okay? So these give us uh, our largest storms, they give us our warmest storms. They give us the combination of warm and wet, okay? And ultimately, on the ground, they, they become uh, major flood uh, generators and uh, drought busters in this part of the world. So here we're looking at, for northwest Nevada, the numbers of drought breaks, if you look back to, back to 1895, uh, using PDSI as a measure of droughts, uh, and if we look for major breaks in droughts, where the, it didn't just break for a moment, for a month or two, it broke for at least uh, six months before you got wandered back into some sort of drought situation. 57% um, of the drought breaks historically have been, have been basically the arrival of, of one or two, because I dive into the months and look at the daily data, uh, one or two atmospheric rivers. That's compared to uh, 40, only 40% in California on the other side of the range at the same latitude. And here's looking only at the winter season, basically the cool season, and the number goes even higher. Atmospheric rivers, I haven't told you, but atmospheric rivers are very much concentrated in the winter months. Okay? And again, 87 here versus 60% uh, in California. So as it happens, they don't penetrate that far, but we don't have that many other mechanisms for getting out of droughts and other mechanisms for making big floods, as you see down at the bottom there. Um, and so you know, they, they play an outsized role here, even compared to the west side of the Sierra, right here, you know, at the same latitude. For, here's 
floods above 50,000, uh, I'm sorry, 5,000 CFS for Carson and Truckee rivers. And you can see that the blue areas, which are the atmospheric rivers, are, you know, dominant uh, processes for, for causing our historical floods. 92% um, by this standard on the Carson. Uh, 74, I don't know if this, this is at all visible, 74% on the Truckee. Uh, the actually on, at, in the California on the other side of the range, um, it falls right in between those. So maybe in terms of floods, we don't have this entirely outsized version of, of their impact. But for droughts, they're kind of consistently uh, even more of a play, even more of a role of, of ending droughts than they do in California. And we thought it was a big deal in California. So lots of recap. And um, basically, I've told you all of this stuff. And, and the main point I want to make, given some of the noise you hear in the media, is not all atmospheric rivers are, are large and nasty. You know, just bear that in mind. Some people think that atmospheric river means uh, sent, you know, a, a hundred year flood or something that, that way at all. Sometimes they do, but they're not always. So now I have to push on really quick and just say, what are we doing with this knowledge? One of the things we've been doing is we've managed to convince the state of California to invest in a new statewide monitoring network that's kind of built on this recognition that atmospheric rivers are kind of the big kahuna in terms of flood risks and droughts and that sort of thing. We went to them with a strategy that looks like this, a tiered stale strategy where we said, look, you know, Let's talk about this in terms of two things. One is, you know, different levels of investment and technology development that are still required. But also, well, yeah, uh, there's that one. So costs and technologies go up as you go up this, this diagram. And, but the other thing was we went to them very specifically to, to suggest to DWR that uh, they were tending to look at any enhancements or maintenance of their net observational networks in terms of what was possible right now. And very often what was possible right now was actually what was possible uh, in the late, in the 90, 80s and 90s and not even what was possible right now because a lot has happened since about 2000 in terms of what's possible in terms of monitoring. Um, and so at the bottom of here is relatively cheap costs and, and we were you know, really looking at how to keep the costs down, but well-defined needs, proven technologies, and we you know, basically pitched it as the, this is the row that is, why aren't we doing this already, uh, levels of, of uh, monitoring. Um, then you move up, and there's technologies and methods that are quite possible now, but the price tags go up, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. Um, but then we said, you know, you, should, you shouldn't even stop there. As you're thinking about your networks today, you should be leaving space, even if it's only in your head, but if possible, in your budgets and in your long-term plans for technologies that we can pretty much guess will become possible in the future, but we don't necessarily have them. You know, if you asked us to go out and put the instrument in right now, we wouldn't, we'd have to say, you know, you're going to have to fund a few more years of research before we're, we're actually able to do that. But we know some things are coming, some things are possible, and, and we said, you know, we don't want you making decisions, you really shouldn't be making decisions now about networks that end up precluding these, these things in the future, that, that you've spent all your money or that you've sort of uh, made all the commitments and promises and then when some new technology comes along, you're kind of, you know, sorry, uh, you have to start all over, find a whole new funding source or whatever. So this was our tiered strategy and our main goal was to get them thinking in the, about long-term plans for network. Uh, development. But to our surprise, we had examples of all these things. To our surprise, the folks at the Division of Flood Management at DWR basically looked at what we had down here and said, let's do it. Okay? As it happened, there had been a flood, uh, flood management bond passed uh, two years earlier, and they were sort of scrambling with what to do with the, the uh, network parts of that funding. <coughs> Timing is everything, but we didn't actually go in expecting them to turn it over to us. That's not the way that DWR usually operates. But so uh, there's that scheme, and I just want to make one other point that's relevant to the networks, and that is basically up there in the corner that 
as it happens, the character of these atmospheric rivers is set up here in the low-level jet, which is a kilometer or so above the surface. And, um, and that's almost the conditions there are almost uncorrelated to what you see at, at, at sea level, okay, at the surface as these things approach. So what's going on here, this curve, is correlation of, precipita with pre of precipitation at Bodega Bay, basically, on the coast uh, north of Cal San Francisco, to the conditions measured at all different altitudes up to uh, about, what is that, about 600, probably 600, maybe 500 millibars there. And what you see is that at about a kilometer above the surface, the conditions there dictate the precipitation at Bodega Bay, the strength, the outcome of the storm, with a correlation that's out there about 0.65, whereas the surface met, met measurements are back here at 1.15, so not really, as it happens, statistically significant. So somehow we need to actually, we can't get by with standard on the ground measurements. We need to look up into the atmosphere. So tier one, this, the, the just do it range, we went with this. We, we went to them and said, look, you know, you, you guys, you know, in the late 90s, um, measuring soil moisture was still a hugely expensive and aggravating process. Uh, neutron probes and all this stuff that were very human intensive and you had to fight with the NRC because they were nasty little uh, new, uh, radioactive sources and that sort of thing. It was really expensive. As, you, as many of you probably know right now, you can go online and buy a, a, a soil moisture uh, probe uh, with a logger attached for about 300 bucks. And if you want to put several of them down into the, into the ground, um, different levels in the soil, you know, you're probably going to bump it up to about 500 bucks for a site. So this suddenly got cheap, and you don't have to dig You don't dig them out every year. You don't have to do like with a, a neutron probe where you go out and literally lower it down and lift it back up for, in a borehole. So this got really cheap in terms of operations and capital costs. Uh, we, we, had recognized, we had gone through and recognized measurements that were kind of still needed. One of them, the most important one, frankly, for a lot of the, the uh, river forecasters is where's the snow level, uh, you know, during the course of a storm or from storm to storm. And I'll show you in a minute, you know, how this was being done for the most part by NOAA um, in research mode. And it's, a, about a, it's literally a half million dollar operation with upward looking radars and acoustic sounders and all this stuff. But we went to the... Uh, Marty Ralph was my uh, compatriot on this. He was actually running a lab at uh, NOAA at the time. So he went to them after we had, and said, you know, the strongest signal that you get in those upward looking radars is the so called bright band, which is essentially at the snow versus rain line in the atmosphere. That's a very, it, you know, you have to put all sorts of filters on to see beyond this, this big bright band of returns from radar. So what if we didn't put all those filters on? What if we stripped it down and only looked for that bright band? As I said, this, this what I'll show you, I think, on the next slide, the, uh, the big full-blown full version of this upward-looking radar stuff is about a half a million dollars, and that's capital costs. I mean, that, that's, it's big money. Um, by just, by stripping it down and saying the one thing that we want to be able to do more places, you know, a lot of places, it's a snow level in the atmosphere where the, it goes from ice to rain to, to liquid. Um, got it down to $25,000. Okay? You know, they were spending whatever that is, 90, 98% of their money on figuring out how to see past this thing, which is actually what you want if you're going to forecast floods. So this suddenly became very cheap, certainly when we compared it to what we had been asking them to help us fund previously. Very cheap. And finally, uh, these, the, there's a way of measuring the total amount of water vapor in the atmosphere uh, using high-end GPS stations, such as are used in, uh, in geotechnical work, uh, in geodetic work, that sort of thing, to look for the offsets associated with, uh, with earthquakes, and more recently these days in terms of uh, droughts drying out the surface and that sort of thing.
Um, as it happens, because of the seismic and, and solid earth uses of that kind of GPS, there are thousands of those uh, antenna out there. Those antenna aren't cheap by my standards, which is to say they're about 20 grand a pop, okay? For me, that's a lot of money. Um, but there are thousands of them out there. It turns out that to take them from just measuring whether the Earth's surface is moving up or down or right or left, that sort of thing, to also, at the same time, telling you how much water vapor is in the atmosphere, like the SSMI imagery, all the way up to, up to space, um, you have to give it a fairly high-end barometer and a thermistor, a, te a thermometer, basically. That's it. That's, you know, again, that's maybe 500 bucks a pop. So we made deals with the uh, UNAVCO folks, who are the solid earth folks, to, we'll, we'll provide you these things. All these stations, most of these stations have got telemetry, they've got, you know, they've got power, they've got site agreements for locating them there, all that sort of stuff. And so by just buying them some really low-end uh, meteorological monitors, um, we, we, we could turn these into, uh, into those total water vapor in the atmosphere things that I showed you early on we couldn't see over the continents. Okay? So we went to them and said, you know, this is cheap. All these things are things that have now gotten to a place where they're so cheap that you just, you know, why aren't you already doing it? And they bought into it. NOAA put up half the money. DWR put up half the money. Um, now, tier two, as I said, was stuff that we knew how to do, but it, you know, pricey, okay? And so here, we basically went to the, we at the same time said, okay, tier two, we're thinking, well, what we really told them is we want seven of these atmospheric river observatories, four down the coast and three in the central valley. Uh, and what they do is, they, these are the ones that have the, the acoustic sounders up into the atmosphere, uh, upward looking radar, distrometers. This is the full, I'm not sure if I can see the distrometer here. It's not, these aren't the laser ones, Adrian. These are the pillow ones. Um, expensive proposition, basically. And um, as I say, when you actually uh, calibration and uh, maintenance for the time being, that sort of stuff, one of these ends up costing, you know, as it says there, in the range of $750 thousand dollars and up. Um, so we couldn't ask for many of these. We asked for seven. You always ask for more than you're going to get. They basically came in and they funded, it actually took them two years of the tier one before they said, okay, this is making sense. And they came back to us and said, okay, we're going for tier two now. They agreed to four of these. We got two of them in place. We're still putting in two more. Um, and so we end up with this network, got awful network, but the big circles are our atmospheric river observatories. What they do is they tell us, give us the picture of what's going on, winds, uh, hydrometeors, uh, uh, temperatures up all the way through the atmosphere so we can see the details within the atmospheric river. We've got four of those big, dot, big circle, yellow circles, red, purple, white um, uh, circles. The smaller circles are soil moisture stations, and so on. Um, uh, what, these guys here, these squares, are our snow level radars. Um, and if you think about this, this is a very different look than the, 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 uh, the typical surface meteorology uh, network that we have. This isn't to replace it, but this is to home in on the, these, these processes that are absolutely key to our ability to, uh, to forecast and to, uh, and to track, frankly. The, uh, the progress of various storms and flood generators uh, in, in the state. And I'll just say, this data is online. Um, uh, here's where to get it. There's some of it on CDEC, but it's pretty well buried in, in CDEC, which is the California Data Exchange Center. Um, yeah. So we did all that. Um, I mentioned three, you know, tier three, which is, we don't know exactly how to do it, but we, I'm pretty sure you're going to want to do it. And here were the examples we used. We, wanted, we said we need some, you need some lead time offshore. When you're in Boston, you see weather forecasts, and it's based on watching storms come all the way across the continent, thousands of measurements as it comes across. In California, we tend to see them in satellites, and then they show up, and, and we move on from there. We need some stuff offshore. Uh, we don't actually know how to do this very well, and in fact, we haven't had any takers for this part of it. 
perfectly honest. But the other thing we said is, you know, elsewhere in the country, you got these next rad systems and that sort of thing. It goes to hell in the West and in California, for instance, it goes to hell because they look out and they see mountains. You see it all the time in the, in the weather ra ra radar here in, in Reno, these strips where there's no measurements, no, no returns coming from. Um, and, you know, there are cheap, cheaper versions. It's not an extra, it's a smaller radar, but we, you can put them out there and sort of patch some of those. Look at it, go to a different place and look at the place where you can't see with, uh, with next rad with a cheaper radar. This one we've got uh, folks in the wine country and in the Bay Area are actually putting in gap, uh, gap filling radar. Um, this is a situation where the state wasn't going to step up for that, but locally they did. And my hope is that once they get that in place, you're going to see LA saying, well, we want some of that, and we'll build it up by locales wanting it. Um, gosh, okay, yeah. Uh, so I should, I should be wrapping this up, but I'll just say there is a certain amount of that, well, we want some of that, because once we were starting to talk about this, this program, of this new network, the Western States Water Council, which is an arm of the uh, Western Governors Association, stood up and said, well, you know, we want some of that. And so they asked us to put together a vision of what, how you might expand this kind of, this kind of network far beyond Nevada. And uh, I got to say, this was a hot topic about two years ago. You see there the date on that is 2014. It's kind of fallen by the wayside for the time being because we've been f all focused on drought in California and, and you know, we've been a lot of focus in California, but we have a couple of different uh, position statements or sort of policy statements by the Western Governors Association indirectly uh, that say we want to do something like this and so it could, could still reemerge basically. Um, the idea when we went to do that is it's not all atmospheric rivers. You, know, you get away from the 90% of the big floods or atmospheric rivers as you move inland. And so you have to think about other storm mechanisms. But as we looked around atmospheric rivers over in the coast, uh, North American monsoon in the summer, and, and often, more often in the interior, and even Rocky Mountain upslope storms, um, you know, it seemed to us that the missing element the thing that we weren't getting that our, our network in California was designed specifically to target is those vapor transports. Now, it's something that's been very difficult to get in the past because it happens a kilometer or more above the surface. The only way we see that is with weather balloons and the like. Weather balloons go off twice a day, and there aren't many of them, and so we've, we've really been largely blind to that. And what we've done is use lots of proxies, like 700 millibar anomalies, and things like that to get a sense of which way the winds were going and said, oh, that's carrying moisture this way or that way. Um, we've got the technologies now to actually look up or look down through the atmosphere to actually follow this stuff. And we basically went back to the Western States Water Council and said, the thing that's missing is, you know, is to use some of these new, newer technologies to get at really tracking water vapor transports because that's what drives the model, uh, the, the storms. Now, beyond the, the network, and I know I'm getting, getting, the hook is coming, but we're also doing, we've also been working for the last several, uh, several years, actually since 20, 2009, at, in fits and starts, at research flights out, like the ones I mentioned in 1998, research flights out to actually visit storms with a wide variety of partners. And uh, the trick, the, the way to think about that is just that you, whenever you hear about hurricanes, you know, what do you hear about? You hear about some, some flights going out and measuring the hell out of it. Uh, you know, we don't have that on the West Coast. And our sense was at the top of that pyramid, very expensive, don't quite know how to do it, is we want offshore, offshore reconnaissance. That's a huge ticket number, but we want, you know, British Columbia, Alaska, uh, the West Coast states, uh, Hawaii. We want, you know, we want to really just sort of make this a regional problem to be addressed such that we can now see the storms days before they arrive and really get a measure, get their measure days before they arrive, uh, I should say. In this one, we had like four different flight, four different aircraft and one, one research ship out there in the winter of 2015, last winter. Um, 
And this winter, we've, we, we sort of took a breath and said, we can't, co- we can't get the money to do all that. But we were able to arrange, uh, Marty Ralph largely did that, that, but managed to arrange with the Air Force to go ahead and use some of their, so last weekend we had flights taking off of these C-130s, taking off from Hawaii and cutting through an atmospheric river that way. And one coming down from, uh, from Washington, uh, cutting at the other end of it, when, as they fly across, they're dropping those drops on. So we're getting this three-dimensional vision of the uh, storms. So this is going on. Uh, the, my, the idea is, yeah, it's a lot of research, but the idea is ultimately we want offshore uh, reconnaissance flights. We're also looking at how these things change in climate change scenarios, climate change projections, and I'll just say that that's a, there's a lot of literature that's just been coming out in, a lot of that stuff is 2015 and 2016, so a lot of it coming out just now, but you know, we're trying to understand how these things uh, will change in the future. And my final slide, and that's, and where all this stuff comes together is that we recently, um, a little bit less than two years ago now, uh, established a Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes down at Scripps, down in La Jolla, We're teaming with, te- with groups all over the West, including up here with our uh, Western Regional Climate Center, to make new observations. You know, this center is dedicated to these purposes. As it happens, last fall, the county legislature passed and the governor signed SB uh, 758. They basically directed California DWR to, uh, to engage with, with the center to expand the research into this. And there's a ton of good forecast, you know, always up to date forecast uh, information and, uh, and synopses of research efforts and that sort of thing, including these, these flights and the like, at that uh, really pretty simple URL, CW3E at UCSD. So I sh- went over a little bit. Well, all right, went over about 15, 20 minutes. But um, so, uh, any, uh, any questions? I don't know if I can even do that, but I'll ask the question.